What a great and cold Sunday. Everybody alive and well? Good, good. See, y'all are talking back to me already. I appreciate that. If you don't know me, my name's Todd. I'm the pastor. Just want to welcome you and say thank you for coming. Uh, excited about the series that we're in. Excited about the Christmas season. I I'm just going to be honest. I, I used to be kind of a Grinch. That's, that's true. My wife's with us this service, babe. I was kind of a, dr a Grinch back in the day, and now I like Christmas music, and I love the Christmas season. See, it's spiritual growth right there. You come long enough, and if you're a Grinch, maybe you'll turn into a non-Grinch. Um, but this season, we're doing two things. Here's the two things that we're doing as a church during the Christmas season. Number one is fighting for family, for healthy family, and for spiritual family. We are fighting for family. That's why we're doing the series called Never Home alone because God's heart is for you to be in a healthy family. And you may say, well, my biological family is totally crazy. Um, that's, that's all right. Join the club. So everybody here has at least one crazy family member, right? How many of you got one, at least one crazy family member? I know the drill. If you didn't raise your hand, you're probably the crazy family member. <laughs> and we're fighting for family. And here's the second thing that we're doing. We're giving hope. We're giving hope. We're partnering with four local schools and we are working in coordination with both administration and particularly the counselors so that we can be a blessing to 75 kids right around this area that we want to help provide Christmas gifts and a great meal for them on Christmas. And here's our heart. We don't want them to wake up and on Christmas morning and receive nothing. We want them to know that they are loved and valued. So. What's really cool is that you have an opportunity, and I'm just gonna encourage you to do it. Partner with these schools by partnering with us. Let's come together as a family and let's sponsor these 75 kids. It's $30 a kid and they get a whole array of gifts. My wife and I are sponsoring, we're sponsoring four kids, one for each of our, our children. And honestly, maybe you're here and you say, you know what, I wanna be a blessing to more. And you can drop what's 75 times 30, whatever that amount is, that you can help us reach kids. Here's why because we take reaching people and building lives very seriously. And God has blessed us and we wanna be a blessing to others. How many of you are excited to be a blessing? You love being a blessing to other people. Come on, somebody say yes, amen, clap your hands, do something. Are you excited about that? You may say, I don't have $30. I'm barely making it with, with myself. Well, first of all, then you need to let us know so we can be a blessing to our family first. And then secondly, show up here on Saturday, I believe that's the 22nd, where all of the families from, uh, from those schools are gonna come and we get to love on them and be a blessing to them and give them their stuff. Isn't that cool? You get to be a part of it. And here's the, here's the wonderful thing. Family, when done right, is a blessing to those in it and a blessing to the people around them. And that's what we wanna do. That's why we exist. We exist to reach people. God loves you. God knows you. He has a purpose and a plan for you and build lives on the truth of God's word. And that's what we're getting into today, the truth of God's word. So we're gonna be talking uh, today about the relationship that David had with his family and the family that he chose. And the, the basis for this whole series, Never Home Alone, is one of my life verse, uh, verses. It, it's Psalm 68, 6. It says, God makes a home for the lonely. But you got to read that with me, okay? Y'all going to read that with me today? Here we go. Just the first part, up to the semicolon. If you don't know what that is, it's right here, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all hate English. Um, remember, my degree's in it. So God make you ready? Here we go. God makes a home for the lonely. We're going to read it again. You got to, you got to read it like you mean it. God makes a home for the lonely. It's just so true. God makes a home for the lonely. Maybe you've got a vibrant, great relationship with God and you go, I've got family that's healthy and I've got spiritual family that's awesome. Great, because there are a lot of lonely people. And if you say, I'm not really not lonely, then God's heart and desire is to use you to be his hands and his feet to those who are lonely so that they have a place to go and a place to be and a place to belong. God makes a home for the lonely. Look at this. He leads the prisoners into prosperity. Only the stubborn and rebellious dwell in a parched land. And let me just tell you right now, I recognize that family can be a wreck. In fact, we talked last week about what it takes to, to be a blessed family and, and why family is often viewed as a curse rather than a blessing. Because here's why. Here's why it's often viewed as a curse rather than a blessing. Because family is full of problems. Somebody say amen. Even healthy, good families are still full of problems. Even healthy, good families are full of pain. 
Did you know that? Families are full of problems and pain. How many of you say, yep, you just described family. I got it. It's, we live in a broken and messed up world and family is full of problems and pain. And all we have to do is look in the Bible to see that that is absolutely true. In fact, when God called Abram and really was changing his name to Abraham, part of the covenant that he had with him in like the initiation, almost hazing into the family. Do y'all know what it was? He's like, Abram, Abraham, if you're going to be part of my family, here is what I'm asking of you. Do you know what he asks of him? Nobody knows, really. Why did I sound like an English person? <laughs> really? Nobody knew. He circumcised an old man. Listen to me. Family is full of problems and pain, but do you know why? It's full of people. But you have to know some things. This is just reviewing last week. You have to know some things if you want to have a blessed family. You have to know that God has a people and a place for you. God has a people. God has a place for you. Do you know that? Because there's some things in the knowing. You've got to know God has a people. God has a place for you. The next thing that you're going to have to know is that life is a journey and you need to live in the moment. Anybody here want a blessed family? Come on. Does anybody want a blessed family? Then you have to know that God has a place and a people for you. You have to know that life is a journey, that it is, it is walking it out one step at a time. And the, the other thing you have to know is that your faith, your believing and trusting God in the problem times with the people that are difficulty through the pain, your faith will facilitate your future. That is what you have to know. God has a place for me. God has a place for me. God has a people for me. I know it. You have to know that. If you want to have a blessed family, you got to know that God has a people for you, a place for you. You got to know that it's a journey and what you do in the moment right now determines what's to come because your faith will facilitate your future. It was all last week. Here's the thing. Last week was about knowing. This week is about doing. Because if we have faith for what God's called us to, that if you, if you, if you look at your family, whether it's biological or even a spiritual family, and you go, it, it's, it's not what it could be. Like you have faith. If you have faith for God to do something in you and you believe for the future that he has and you're willing to walk the journey because you know there's a, there's a people and a place that he has for you, what are some practical things you can do? Today, I want to talk to you about those practical things. There's three very simple things that you can do. And we're looking at the life of David. This is David of David and Goliath fame. But before he was ever famous, he was just a rejected kid that was most likely, most theologians believe, that he was just the product of an affair. And though he grew up in his daddy's home, he was totally rejected. And we know that because when the number one man of God and ruler of the whole nation shows up at his father's house, his dad shows off all of his boys except for David. Probably because David was a product of, of an affair, most likely, a moment of indiscretion. David even writes later, I was conceived in iniquity. He dealt with rejection for most of his life. And yet God saw fit to use him in some pretty massive ways. Y'all know the David and Goliath story, even if he didn't grow up in church, most people know that story, don't you? Well, we're gonna pick up the story right after David as a young boy, maybe 14, 15 years old, has just slain Goliath. And y'all know how he killed Goliath, right? How did he kill Goliath? Come on, just shout it out. It's like, whoo. So it took the rock and he did the thing. Okay, he probably didn't kill him with the rock. At least I don't think he did because that was, you're talking about a nine and a half foot tall guy and, and a slingshot. Maybe those slingshots are pretty impressive in how they use them. But, but we know this, that if the rock didn't kill him, what happened next really did. Because David, after he whacks him in the head with the rock and boom, he falls down. I kind of think Goliath was probably groggy. And David goes up to him and the guy's oh, lying on the ground. David grabs Goliath's sword. Now, David's just a kid. He grabs Goliath's sword and then he, and he hacks off Goliath's head. I love this story. 
He hacks off this giant's head. Now remember, there's armies on either side. There's a valley down below. David's down in the valley, just took out the champion who was held for 40 days and nights. He's held the armies at bay because he's cursed God the whole time. David chops off his head, reaches down, grabs Goliath's head by the hair, picks it up and drags it back to his camp. Both armies are too stunned to do anything. And David walks into the king's tent and drops the head right in front of the king. The king and, and his number one general are just tripped out. They're, who is this kid? They actually, hey boy, who's your daddy? What in the heck? You're just a kid. How did this even happen? And if you read the story, I, I think they were just sending David to the slaughter and they were gonna try and capitalize on his death, but he came back victorious because God was with him because he had a heart for God. And God's with us and we have a heart for him, particularly, I believe, in regards to family. And we pick up the story right there where David has just dropped the head of Goliath in front of the king. Now remember, it's the first king of Israel. Israel, this is a new thing. This king and his name's Saul and he was picked he was picked by God, but it was, the, it was the person that the people wanted. He looked like a king. The Bible says he was, he was head and shoulders taller than everyone else. He was a good looking guy. He was a sharp guy, looked like a king. And David's just dropped this kid, this little puny kid has just dropped this redheaded kid, most likely, has dropped the head of Goliath. I know, what are y'all looking at? Why are y'all laughing about that? that? Ain't funny, said it was ruddy. Drops the head of Goliath in front of Saul and just told Saul who his father was because Saul had asked. First Samuel 18, verses one through four. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan, this is the, son's, the son of the king. Jonathan, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as himself. There was a joining that took place in this moment. David's just spoken with Saul and Saul's been like, who's your daddy? Where are you from? How did you do this? And Jonathan, the son of the king, the prince is watching all of this and something happens inside of him. And there's a joining that takes place. It's Psalm 68, six, God makes a home for the lonely. Jonathan, his heart was knit to that of David's. I understand what it's like to be joined to family. Listen, I have a tremendously healthy and wonderful biological family, but I remember the moment that the church that we came from in, in Broussard, our savior's church, was a little podunk nothing with hardly anybody at the church, maybe this many people right here in one service. And we went for the first time when the church first started. And while we're sitting there, God does that to my wife and I. And before the service is over, I lean over and say, we're, this is where we're supposed to be. There was, a, there was a divine knitting and joining and it was awesome. And, and it actually, we moved, we physically moved to be a part of the church, not knowing what it would become, but knowing that God was in it. And when God's in something, good things come. It came about when he finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as himself. Look at verse two, Saul took him that day and didn't let him return to his father's house. Saul took David, didn't let him go back home. If we look at the life of Saul, even though he looked like a king, he seldom acted like a king. Even from the first time that, that he, was, he was crowned as king, there was always two things that we see in, in Saul, maybe three, insecurity, fear, and doubt, always. And if we look at, at the history of Saul, those three things, particularly the, the insecurity and the fear, mark his life. And anybody that operates in insecurity and fear, they always have to take those whom they deem a threat or they don't understand and they want to keep them close so they can control them. It's the mark of unhealthy family. This is what Saul does to David. Verse three, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. This is the foundation stone of every healthy family. Covenant, covenant with David. He made a covenant. That is a promise that, that, that is a, a vow that is never to be revoked he, because he loved him as himself, himself. And look at verse four. So because of this covenant and his love, this is what Dave, uh, Jonathan did for David. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his bow and his belt. 
Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him. Also his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. I think in this verse, we see a hallmark key for us in understanding how to make a home, how to make a healthy family. You ready? Here's the first point. It's in your worship guide. It's on the notes in the app. Here it is. Number one, if you want to make a God home, a God family, number one, you have to surrender to it. There has to be something inside of you that surrenders to that moment because I am just a firm believer that there are God moments that he just stirs our heart, that there's something in us for family. Maybe it's not even biological family because your biological family is a wreck, but just like Lisa and I had that moment where it's like, it was God stirring. We had a choice. We had a choice where we gonna surrender and enter into covenant. That means I give my heart, my life, my soul to those relationships, to that family. You wanna make a God home? You have to surrender to family. What, what does that practically look like? I think that we see in verse four of 1 Samuel 18, a really good picture of what it meant because each of those items that, that, that Jonathan took off, he took these things off and, and he says, my, my soul and my heart is knit to yours. I'm making a promise. I'm making a covenant with you, David. And here's where it begins. He took his robe off his robe that signified that he was royal blood, that he was a prince. And he said, my identity, this is what that robe represents. My identity, it doesn't matter. In fact, every good thing that I, that I cling to is my identity, I give to you. Then he took off his armor. It's, it's more than likely like his, the mail, like the chain mail that was used to protect him in battle. But on that chain mail, just like even soldiers today were all of the ribbons, were all of the medals that showed all of the campaigns, that showed all of the battles that had been fought and won. It was all of his accomplishments. And he takes that off and he says, I don't care what happens to me. In fact, every good thing I've ever done, I give to you. He was surrendering his identity. He was surrendering everything that he'd done that was noteworthy. He's giving it to David. And then he takes his sword. Now, this was so important because the sword, yes, it represents protection, but I want you to recognize the Bible is very clear. At that time, because they were under such oppression, they only had two swords in the whole nation. Jonathan carried one and Saul the king carried the other. And Jonathan takes off his sword that was priceless and says, I'm not going to defend myself against you. I'm going to give you that which is most precious in my life, and I'm going to put it in your hands. You can use it to protect you or kill me. This is surrendering to family. Then he took his bow, which was certainly a weapon of war, but it was more often used to kill game. It was provision. What, what did he surrender? His identity, all of the accomplishments that he had done, his protection, his provision, and then the last thing, which I honestly think is probably the most important. See, they wore robes at that time, but they would hold everything together. They would, they would hold everything together. And that's where, that's where you'd put your bow, that's where you'd put your sword. But most importantly, it, it, it kept you covered. And he took off of his belt. And he said, I'm committed to you and I'm gonna walk with you in transparency. This is a picture of healthy, godly family. You surrender to it. Can I just tell you, this is a heart issue that I have to deal with, that you have to deal with. Do I surrender to family? What's the opposite of surrender? You know what it is? It's fighting. Do you fight family? or do you surrender to it? I recognize that there are some supremely unhealthy, ungodly, terrible things that happen in family. And you may have to step outside of that because of the abuse that takes place, because of the horrific things that take place. I recognize that, but can I tell you, your heart still needs to be surrendered to the purpose and plan that God has in you, not in the other people, in you and what he wants to do in you and family. Are you willing to surrender in a God moment your identity, the things that you've done, 
that which is most precious to you that you use to protect yourself, to provide? Are you committed? In Acts 20, 35, we see that Jesus has said, he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. This was actually the hallmark verse for our last series on finances. But here's the thing, we didn't focus on the giving part, but on the receiving part, because here's the revelation that I've had. Most people have trouble receiving from God and receiving good things from others, because family and surrendering to it is not just about you giving up your identity, giving all of your accomplishments, your protection, your provision, your commitment. You surrendering to family is also receiving from others good things. And when they're saying, I am part of you, that this, and, and this is the, the relationship that my wife and I have had to deal with as well, that it's, I'll just be honest, it's been so hard for me, it's easier for me to give than it is to receive and to believe. Okay, all those nice things that she's saying about me, maybe they're true. Maybe she's for real. And I'm just convinced that so much dysfunction, both in, in biological family and in, and in spiritual family and in friends, because friends are the family that you choose, comes from here because people have trouble receiving this. Think about David. He was just a kid. Rejected all his life. Just a shepherd. And now the prince of the entire nation is giving him all of this stuff. Do you know what I think most people probably would have done? I, I can't take that. I'm not royalty. No, there's a, that sword. No way. Your arm. Look at that's all what you did. I can't take that. I can't take that. There is a humility that must take place inside of us to not just give of ourselves and family, but to receive good things as well. Does this make sense, guys? Y'all are really quiet. Does this make sense? You have to surrender to it. You have to surrender to it. You have to know it's in the hall, outside, right there in the foyer. You're better together. We are better together, spiritual family. My family, when we are together and we operate in humility, it's amazing. You have to surrender to it. Here's the second thing. You have to stick with it. You have to stick with it because it is easy to walk away from family. It is easy to, instead of surrender, to fight family and to walk away because family's messed up so often. Isn't that true? Come on. Are y'all there? You have to stick with it. You have to stick with it. How do you do that? Three simple things. We'll go through these quickly. You have to understand authority. You have to understand authority. God referred to himself. He refers to himself as father. There is authority in family. In fact, one of the Ten Commandments is honor your father and your mother. Honor isn't necessarily obedience because if your parents ask you to do something unethical or immoral, you can honor them and not obey. But the foundation and the truth that we must understand authority to have a healthy family and to be able to stick with it is just truth. You have to understand authority. Look at 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. It says, whatever Saul asked David to do, he did it successfully. So Saul made him commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. David did what was, whatever was asked of him. He's like, I'll do it. I'll do it. Rebellion says this. Why do I have to do that? Who, who, who think... Who are you? Oh, just because you, you, you mom and you think you know everything best, just because you daddy, you think you know what the right thing is to do. Can I tell you, to stick with family, you have to understand authority and you have to be willing to submit to it. And that's not fun. It's hard. What is, what is the foundation stone for sticking with it in authority? You know what it really is? It's humility. And you have to know, you have to know this. You should write this down. Family isn't fair. It's just not. Family's not fair. Not always fair. Not always just either. God is just. Even God's not fair, but at least he's just. But sometimes family isn't even just. David found himself in the situation with Saul, who out of insecurity, fear, and doubt, 
put David in a place that, that he was hoping over and over that he would fail. And in the end, when instead of failing, David submitted to his authority and was successful. Saul was so frustrated that he tried to kill him. Look at 1 Samuel 18, 10 and 11. While David was playing the harp with his hand, he's, he's playing the harp because if you read the verses before, Saul is raging. He's like going nuts. So he's just raging. And David's playing, he's playing the guitar, trying to calm him down. It says, David was playing the harp with his hand as usual, but a spear was in Saul's hand. And Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I'll pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. David stuck with it even when it wasn't fair. He stuck with it. Finally, he realized, okay, this is very unhealthy and I shall die if I stay where I am. But did David walk away from family? He didn't. Even when he left the physical presence because he needed to, because it was a life or death situation, he still, and here's the second thing, he exhibited grace. If you're going to stick with family, you have to understand authority. And the second thing, and that's an honor issue, by the way. And the second thing is he exhibited grace. He exhibited grace. What, what does that practically look like? He didn't give Saul what he deserved. Because if the guy's trying to kill you, David could have claimed self-defense and killed him. Instead, he exhibited grace, humility, forgiveness. Look at... 1 Samuel 24, David is now on the run. Saul has gone stark raving mad and he's out to kill David. He's tracking him down, hunting him like he's an, an animal that he's going to kill. And David has a group of men that have rallied around him that are helping David. And they're actually at En Gedi, which is right along the Dead, Dead Sea. I've been there. And it's, it's, there's a big plateau, but there's this ravine. It's like this little notch in, in the plateau and there's a stream that flows down it. And in the ravine walls, there's all these little caves. And this is where David with Saul hot on his heels, that's where David and his men are hiding in one of these small caves. It says, at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. That's great. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. David and his men are there. And his men, this is what they do. They whisper to him, David, now's your opportunity. Today, the Lord's telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your, into your power to do as you wish. God's telling you that. There's Saul. He's vulnerable. Go get him. So David crept forward. That had to be kind of like embarrassing and gross all at the same time. He crept forward. His men wanted him to kill Saul. And he cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began to bother him because he had cut Saul's robe. Look what he says. He said to his men, this is what he comes back and tells his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king, the guy who's trying to kill me, the guy who's hunting me like I'm a wild animal, the guy who wants to cut my head off and put it on a post outside the city gates. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. Look at verse seven. This is crazy. So David restrained his men and he didn't let them kill Saul. If you're going to stick with family, you're going to have to restrain yourself. Here's the other aspect. If you're going to stick with family, you have to understand authority. You have to exhibit grace, but you have to get with God. You have to get with God. David, uh, later in the story, finds himself in what is modern day Gaza, right by modern day Gaza. And he's hiding in a cave. And now he has hundreds of guys that have joined themselves to him. But it's, the Bible says it's all the people who are disgruntled, who, um, who are, are, are vagabonds, who owe taxes. They're, they're just, they're, they're scummy guys. And they all join themselves to David. But David turns them into his mighty men, into great warriors. Um, and one day when they're out raiding the enemies of Israel, they come back to their home at Ziklag where they all lived with their wives and their families. And the entire town has been burnt, burnt to the ground and all of their women and children are gone. And David's friends that were his mighty men turned on him and they wanted to kill him. And David didn't know what to do. First Samuel 30, verse six. Now David's two wives have been taken captain, Enahim the Jezreelites and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. Look at verse six. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him for all the people were embittered. 
each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. If you want a healthy family, you gotta surrender to it. You gotta stick with it. And you have, to, you have to understand authority. You have to exhibit grace. But here's, and this is such a key point. You have to get with God because you will not make it through the trials, the difficulties, the betrayals, the backstabbings, unless you strengthen yourself in God. And it has to be your God, not your grandma's God, not your papa's God, not your mama's God. It has to be the God that you know that is alive and well and that he is with you. You have to know that his word to you is true. And when difficulty comes, and you want to walk away from everybody and everything, you better get with God. You'll never be able to understand authority. You'll never be able to exhibit grace unless you strengthen yourself in the Lord. How do you make a healthy family, whether it's a biological one or a spiritual one? You surrender to it. You have to surrender to it. You have to stick with it. And then here's the last thing as we wrap up. You have to see the big picture. You have to recognize that family is bigger than you. And the struggle that you have connecting with, maybe it's, maybe it's your family, or maybe it's your spiritual family, is maybe it's the friends that you've chosen as family, and there's a rift there. Let me just tell you right now, you, you gotta surrender to it, you gotta stick with it, you have to see the big picture, because at the end of the day, family is so much bigger than you. It's just bigger than you. In 2 Samuel 7, eight through 10, it says, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. He's speaking to David. And he says, I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel, even when he was just a kid. And what, what does that say? That says that God has a heart for us, even from when we're little. I've been with you wherever you've gone. I've destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now, I'll make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. And I'll provide a homeland for my people, Israel, planting them in a secure place where they'll never be disturbed. God was using David to establish a place for his people. David, the kid who was rejected by his own father. David, the kid that was rejected by his brothers. David, the kid that was rejected by the king. David, the, the man whose own family honestly was pretty much a mess because he had a heart for God. God used him to make a place for you and for me. And that we, I can honestly say that we are here today because one guy surrendered to covenant relationship that one guy stuck with it in spite of all the craziness. He wasn't perfect, far from it. He was not the, the model father. He was not the model husband, but he had a heart for God and he truly repented when he was wrong. He finally, finally saw the big picture and realized, and you have to get this, family is not about you. Making a home is not making a place for you. Making a home is making a place for those who are not with you yet. This is a foundational principle biblically, and it's a foundational principle in our church because we are making a place for those who aren't here yet because we have a heart for God. I've had a revelation of family. It's not always fun. It's not always easy, but listen to me when we surrender to God and to those that he puts in our lives. When we stick with it, even when it's hard, I can promise you that the big picture is bigger than any one individual. David had that revelation in 1 Chronicles 14, 2. It says this, and David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom was highly exalted, look at this, for the sake of his people, Israel. My prayer for you, like honestly, I pray that you have a revelation of family, that you can surrender to it. Maybe like David, you've had to step away. We, we know what that's like, that you have to step away because it's so crazy that it might cost you your life. You step away. You can step away, but still be surrendered and still stick with it. 
but I want you to get the big picture. That's my prayer, Lord, that, that we get the big picture, that what you wanna do in us and our heart and surrendering to you and, and, and building covenant relationship and sticking with it has everything to do with you and nothing to do with you. I know that sounds oxymoronic. It sounds like two things that can't be, but listen to me carefully. Family has everything to do with you and nothing at all to do with you. Healthy family starts with you, but the nothing part of it with you has to do with the generations to come. You never know what's on the other side of your obedience. You never know what's on the other side of your humility. You never know what's on the other side of your faithfulness. Where does faithfulness, humility, obedience begin? It begins with faith, believing God has a people and a place for you, believing I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, not for calamity and destruction, but to give you a future and a hope. Lots of people have been hurt by family. Lots of people find the holidays the most difficult season out of the whole year because they felt like David, rejected, alone, unwanted. But I'm telling you, God makes a home for the lonely. Let's bow our heads. Maybe you're here and you needed to hear this message. Maybe you know that God's calling you even in this moment to make a family, his family. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I know this message is for me. I felt like, I felt like I've been fighting family rather than surrendering to it. I feel like walking away rather than sticking to it. And I can't see, I can't see anything in, in it because it's just been a mess. I just wanna pray God's blessing over you. If this message is for you and you say, I, I know it, I just wanna pray that God does a work in you knowing that it'll overflow into your family. That's you, just raise your hand, say, Pastor, I know this message was for me. You can leave them up. I want to pray for you. Father, I just pray just blessing on everybody whose hands raised. Lord, I just pray that where they feel like it's maybe been like a, a pitfall, that, that like a minefield, they don't even know where they step and things just blow up in their face. That Father, that you just begin a healing process in them. And though people may have let them down, that Father, that they know that you never will and that you begin a work inside of them that's transformative and it brings them to a place of promise that you have for them and a blessing that generationally they may never see themselves on this earth, but fathers, they look down from heaven like David is on us today, that he can see and they'll be able to see. Faithfulness is a great reward. You can put your hands down and, and maybe you're here today. And you don't know if you're a part of God's family. And I'm telling you, he wants you to be. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God loves you. He gave his own son to take the penalty and the punishment for your sin. And Jesus, while on this earth said, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. God makes a home for the lonely. God makes a home for you. How do you, be, how do you become a part of God's family? Listen to me, this isn't about a church membership deal. This is about you embracing the truth that God knows you and loves you and he makes a home for you. This is a heart issue, not an organizational issue. God makes a home for the lonely. How, how, do, you, how do I get to be a part of God's family? It's as, it's as easy, honestly, as ABC. A, admit. Admit, I'm not a part of God's family. I, I know my shortcomings and my sin. I see it. You admit that to yourself and to God. And then B, you believe that God knows you. He loves you. He has a place for you. That Jesus came to this earth. God squeezed into an earth suit. And he took the punishment for your sins. 
His blood was shed. His, his body was broken for you. And you believe, God, you know me. You love me. I believe that Jesus, you paid the price for my sin on that cross. And then see, you confess. You say, Jesus, I give my life to you. I'm yours. God wants you to be a part of his family. The greatest day of my life was the day that I surrendered to that call and I became a part, not of the Schumacher family that happened at my physical birth, but my spiritual birthday when I surrendered to him. Maybe you're here today and today is your spiritual birthday and you know it needs to be. It's like it hadn't happened yet. If that's you, if nobody's looking around, if you're here and say, Pastor, I know I need to surrender my life to him. If that's you, just raise your hand right now and say, Pastor, I need to pray that prayer. Thank you. I see you right here. Anybody else? Anybody else say, today, I know. All right, can we, can we pray? Can we all pray? Just repeat after me, say, dear Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the son of God. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give those folks a hand? We're wrapping up. We'll be dismissed in about 30 seconds. I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be your pastor. And, and listen, if, if God dealt with you today, let me just encourage you just to, to do a couple things. The first is this. Is this. Take, the, take a moment and take the connection card and the seat back in front of you and let us know what's going on, right? Where it says, I've decided you can check that off. Um, and you can drop it either in the boxes by the doors on the way out or at the Connection Center, um, or you could actually fill it out on your app. And the last thing is this. If you need prayer, don't walk out of here today without praying with someone. At the foot of the cross that's projected on the walls of our ministry team, they'd love to pray with you and connect with you. Why don't you stand to your feet? Did you have a good time today? Let me just encourage you. Be family to somebody. Embrace family. Maybe you need to go by that wall. Maybe to get online and, and sponsor some kids. I don't know. But I know this, that when you trust God with your future, he takes care of your present. Father, I pray blessing on everyone here. May they know you and love you and honor you. And may you bless them because of it. And may we know that the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Love you guys. Y'all are dismissed. If you need prayer, you come.